Class and welcome back for another Flex Time Review. Today, we're going to be focused all on your sense of hearing. Let's get started. Unfortunately, we do not have a 3D model for the ear today. Aww. It's crazy. 3D cross sections of the ear go for a very hefty price online. <laughs> not to mention, going inside like the brain and the eye, there's a pretty cool place to travel to. Why don't I want to go inside the ear and be surrounded by earwax? Nasty. So, we're just going to have to stick with a good old fashioned 2D image, but we will work with what we have and overcome this adversity. For us to sense any type of sound, the first thing that has to happen is our ears have to collect sound waves. We can divide the human ear into three sections. The outer ear is going to collect the sound wave, the middle ear is going to amplify the sound wave, and then your inner ear is going to transduce the sound wave into a neural message that your brain can understand. Now let's talk about how sound waves from the outside environment make it all the way to your brain. As I mentioned previously, sound waves are first going to be collected by the outer ear. Traveling through the ear canal, the sound waves will eventually reach the eardrum. The eardrum is going to be a tightly stretched membrane at the end of the ear canal that's going to vibrate when hit by sound waves. The vibrating eardrum in turn causes tiny bones in our ear to also vibrate. There are three of these tiny bones called the malleus, incus, and stapes. Also called the hammer, anvil, and stirrup, we are going to simply refer to these three tiny bones as auditory obstacles. The absence of these obstacles can lead to moderate to severe hearing loss. These bones are going to amplify sound waves and send them to the cochlea. The cochlea is just going to be a fluid filled tube in the inner ear where sound waves trigger nerve impulses. Located inside the cochlea we have our basilar membrane. It is inside the basilar membrane where our sensory receptors for hearing reside. As sound waves enter, Fluid inside the cochlea start to vibrate, creating a ripple. Submerged in this fluid are your hair cells. Hair cells are going to be your sensory receptor for hearing. The hair cells are going to be affected by these ripples caused by the vibrations and move along with them. As the hair bundles attached to the cell move, ions enter through the top of the cell, which is going to cause the release of different chemicals at the bottom of the cell. These chemicals then bind to an auditory nerve cell and create an electrical signal. This signal will then travel along the auditory nerve to the brain. Just like with sight, where different cones were responsible for different colors, depending on the location of the hair cells in the cochlea depend on what type of pitch they are responsible for detecting. The electrical signal then reaches the thalamus, where it is directed to its final destination of the temporal lobe. The temporal lobe will then interpret the message as a sound that we recognize and understand. So, that's the mechanical workings of our ear. A lot of stuff going on just to hear a few sounds. Now, before we move away from our ear diagram, you may have noticed that we still have one box empty. This is where your semicircular canal is located. The semicircular canal are three tiny fluid-filled tubes located in your inner ear that help you with balance. Hair cells, similar to those in the basilar membrane, also reside in the canal. Every time you move your head, liquid sloshes around, moving the tiny hair cells in the semicircular canals. These hair cells then translate the movement into a neural message that is sent to the brain. Your brain interprets the message, and as a result, you are able to maintain a proper balance. Well, this is actually going to be another one of our body senses, known as the vestibular sense, which is mainly responsible for our balance. Our next topic of discussion will be theories on how we discriminate pitch. How exactly are we able to discriminate between the low pitch of a bass guitar and the high pitch of a flute? To explain this, we are going to return back to our basilar membrane. According to the frequency theory, the basilar membrane is going to vibrate at the same frequency as sound waves. So, if we had a sound wave of 100 hertz, hair cells in the basilar membrane would then be excited to vibrate 100 times a second. The neural message is then sent to the brain at the same rate. There is, however, going to be a limit with how fast our neurons can fire. Individual neurons have a firing capacity of about 1,000 times per second, but we are able to sense sounds with frequencies much higher. For example, young children can typically hear pitches ranging from 20 to 20,000 hertz. So how can we explain this? According to the place theory, different frequencies cause larger vibrations at different locations along the basilar membrane. High pitch noises are going to cause maximum vibrations near the stirrup end of the basilar membrane, while lower frequencies excite hair cells at the opposite side of the basilar membrane. The brain looks at the area where the basilar membrane sent the message in order to determine the pitch of the sound wave. Both the frequency and place theory help explain our discrimination of pitch. Frequency is going to explain how we distinguish between low frequencies, while place explains our discrimination to higher pitch sounds. And our last topic of conversation is going to be sensory disorders related to our sense of hearing. Conductive hearing loss occurs when sound cannot get through the outer or middle ear. As a result, it may be harder to hear soft sounds and loud sounds will be muffled. Conductive hearing loss can be a result of multiple different things. 
It could be caused from allergies or ear infections, a hole in the eardrum, or even something as simple as earwax clogging your ear canal, which is pretty gross to think about. The next type of hearing loss we are going to talk about is going to be sensory neural hearing loss. Sensory neural hearing loss is hearing loss that can be attributed to damage in the inner ear. This could be a result of damage to the cochlea or the auditory nerve that attaches to the brain. Sensory neural hearing loss accounts for 90% of cases of hearing loss. In some occasions, sensory neural and conductive hearing loss can happen at the same time. This is when there is both damage to the outer or middle ear along with the inner ear. When hearing loss precludes a person from understanding any form of spoken language, it is referred to as deafness. An interesting fact that I actually learned while looking up some things for this video is that when you see deafness spelt with a capital D, it is referred to what is known as cultural deafness. Culturally deaf people are not necessarily medically deaf and they might not even be deaf at all. An example could be a child with two deaf parents who has normal hearing ability, but their main means of communication with their parents is sign language. There is an organization out there called Hear the World. They're a nonprofit foundation that works towards the equal opportunity and better quality of life for individuals with hearing loss. They have a really cool video here on YouTube that I'm going to link in the description box. It's gonna be a hearing loss simulation. They're gonna play a real catchy jam, and throughout the song, they're gonna manipulate the volume to show you what it would be like to have varying degrees of hearing loss. I highly recommend you check it out. It will help you understand the effects of hearing loss a little better, and like I said, it's a jam. Anyways, that does it for me. As always, if you've enjoyed the video, feel free to subscribe to the channel. It will notify you whenever I post new stuff. See you all next time. Peace.